We have finally made it to the moment of truth for financial markets as we face the biggest piece of economic event risk that this week has to offer. So what is it going to do? That's what we're going to ask ourselves here. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we are going to unpack the U.S. CPI inflation report uh, that we have coming up here within less than 24 hours and walk through here why this is data that has market moving impact, why this should be something that we care about, and then consider what might be the market reaction were this number to go one way or another. So let's do a bit of stage setting here and consider. Everything that has been the backdrop for financial markets, really for the better part of six weeks now, has been an unadulterated stream of positivity. So consider first the Fed. This is the outlook for Fed policy rates that uh, officials unveiled in the middle of September. Uh, this is uh, September 18th uh, update. They, of course, cut rates by 50 basis points that day. And then they went on to say that we are going to have 100 basis points in rate cuts this year, implying there is 50 basis points more in cuts, ostensibly over the incoming meetings left for the year, November and de December. Why a full one percentage point? Well, we can see here the expectation that by um, year end we're going to have rates at 44 percent is about a 100 basis point or one percent step down from the central rate that we had before the these cuts at 5.33 percent that's of course the midpoint uh, of the fed's target range from five and a quarter to five and a half percent or where that range was now that range uh, of course lower by 50 basis points. So when we look at this 4.4 and see that it's about 1% lower than where rates were before the cut, we, needless to say, conclude that there is half a percent in further cuts spread over the next two meetings that's on the menu. For next year, a further 1% or 100 basis points in cuts is what the Fed announces, and that's basically in line, uh, give or take, with where the market thinking is. And the markets are buying it. They are taking the Fed at face value. If we take a look at the way that we are set up for the next two meetings, the markets see a almost 80% chance that we are going to get a cut at each one of these meetings. So we can see here the current range 475 to 500 basis points or 4.75 to 5 percent. And by December, we are expecting to be 50 basis points lower. So with that in mind, the two cuts are there. There is a little bit more controversy when it comes to next year. We can see here uh, the markets have adjusted to a more uh, circumspect setting here. Here's the cut right here. And since then, we've had uh, some of what's on the menu for next year fall away. But it hasn't fallen away in the kind of sense that it would derail the Fed's own forecast, more like the market's overshoot. So right now, uh, the cumulative stimulus we're looking at between now and the end of next year, as we can see, is 129 basis points. If you consider that uh, we're looking at, as we saw, 80% uh, chance that we are going to get 50 basis points of that on the menu before the calendar turns to next year, well, then we're left with 
about 100 basis points for next year. So uh, if we do this math here, we've baked in about uh, 30 plus basis points for this year. That's that slightly less than 100% uh, chance of uh, the two cuts, but very narrowly so. It's overwhelmingly likely. And then for next year, the markets are currently sitting at about 93 basis points, so almost the full 100 basis points that the Fed had penciled in. So the markets are broadly embracing this. On top of this, we've, of course, had a massive announcement of policy stimulus out of China. And the key here has been that uh, we didn't just get another assortment of rate cuts and uh, exhortations to buy stocks, along with money to do that buying being offered by the central bank, uh, along with lower mo mortgage rates being mandated. All of those th things, uh, essentially another, another drop in the monetary stimulus bucket that hasn't worked for three years, but markets clearly animated by the idea that maybe fiscal stimulus is coming after five quarters of essentially no demand, the economy is in deflation market or uh, economy wide where real GDP is running faster than nominal GDP. And if nominal is real plus inflation, and real is higher than nominal, well, that means that the inflation bit is negative. And that's been happening for five quarters in a row now. Having inflation negatively implied this way basically says the entire Chinese economy is on discount. The price of things doesn't fall because there's robust demand, it falls because there isn't that. And so, as you might expect at, at, at your uh, lo at your local store, online or otherwise, when there is no demand, the price is cut to try to inspire that demand. And so, in China, what you've been badly needing is somebody to create demand. And so, the markets have been looking at Beijing, saying, "Well, look at what the West did during COVID. Government spent a bunch of money." Yes, it created some inflation. That's a problem for central banks that they've been fighting for uh, a while now and, of course, increased the cost of living. And it was onerous, but it stopped the economy from careening into a depression when it was on lockdown almost worldwide during the pandemic. That's what markets wanted from China, and that's what we got a whiff of this go-round. So not surprisingly, even though we haven't seen details, we saw a massive rally in Chinese stocks. Now, of course, this week you see that rally is starting to come apart, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But on top of Fed stimulus, at least over the past two weeks and going back to September, on top of the market's embrace of what the Fed was giving them vis-a-vis uh, -vis rate cuts, you also have, at this point, a supportive story from the world's second largest economy, suggesting it is finally, maybe, going to do enough to get up off the mat. So, with that in mind, you then also have, as if this was not collectively good news enough, a warming up of the U.S. economy. This is the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index. It shows how uh, economic data performs relative to forecasts, which, of course, is the most instructive for speculation. The markets care much less about uh a certain number being this or that and care much more about well, whether the number is as expected or not because of course that's what powers speculation. And so we are looking here at a situation where from late August 
the flow of U.S. economic data has so thoroughly improved that not only is it no longer tending to undershoot expectations, which is this setting below zero, it's come back over that level and is in fact accelerating, suggesting that for the first time in five months, U.S. economic data outcomes actually are tending to beat forecasts. And the 19-month high on service sector uh, growth reported by ISM last week, the very strong jobs report reported last week, all of those are cases in point. So you seemingly have stimulus that's in the pipe for the top two economies globally, which collectively uh, account for close to 40% of global GDP. You also have one of those economies, at least, already showing improved vigor. It's not a world without issues, of course. There's still a war going on in the Middle East. There's still a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. But the markets seem relatively sanguine about that. As you can tell here by looking at the spread between the European Brent crude oil benchmark and the U.S.-based WTI benchmark. That's the dark line here. And you can see the spread now is hovering just above $3. That is both below the average for the past month. That's a 20-day moving average. It's also below the long-term moving average. In fact, it's been going down all year. And what that is telling you is that these wars are not spreading any actual supply d disruption into crude oil. If there was, the price of European crude, which is what these wars would be ostensibly disrupting, would be jumping relative to the price of U.S. crude, because if there were issues due to the war in the Middle East disrupting shipments into the Mediterranean uh, from the Persian Gulf through the Suez Canal, that would make European crude more expensive. If there were issues with energy supply uh, f into Europe b b because of what's going on with Russia, another major producer, and Ukraine, there would be a jump in the price of European crude relative to what's going on in the U.S., which, by the way, is a wash in oil. Uh, the U.S. now is a larger producer of petroleum than Russia and Saudi Arabia combined. And so we understandably would have a rising spread here, and we don't. It's actually going the other way. So we don't have even an operational geopolitical concern to sour things. So you'd think this would be incredibly supportive. And yet, what we've actually seen over the past four weeks, we're finally starting to maybe get a little bit more vigor this week, but of course this is a bar that's still active. We'll see how it ultimately looks. But over the preceding four weeks that all of this good news has rolled out, Momentum has only slowed. And this is where the parallels with China start to get curious. This is a very circumspect market given the news flow. Because one would think that with all of everything that's going right, the S&P 500, the benchmark for equity uh, sentiment here, should be screaming high. And yet it's having a hard time limping through July's top. So the question, obviously, seems to be, well, what gives? Why? And the testing of what might be going on here could well be with us here as this CPI data comes out. Now, we just said, consider China. 
we can see that we jumped up here to the highest level that we'd seen since early 2022 and have since fallen by almost 22 percent we're on course to erase all of last week's gains why well we've reopened from a holiday week in china and the first thing that investors there concluded having seen their markets jump to this extent is oh okay sell and it's ostensibly because the confidence in this stimulus provision for whatever reason has faded now there's surveys of the pboc that say that local consumers are biased to saving recently there's any number of explanations uh from chinese stimulus having failed before though it wasn't fiscal from the absence of details on what a fiscal stimulus could look like from circumspect comments from PRC officials. The bottom line seems to be there is less confidence in stimulus and so sentiment cratered. Now, it is unclear why this is limping along as opposed to surging, but one explanation is, of course, expectations for stimulus have been significantly diminished we can see here we're losing rate cuts out of the outlook and the reason we are ostensibly is exactly this we have seen a hotter u.s economy so if it's the china parallel that's operative here just on stimulus sentiment grounds then if we were to get some sort of further doubt around just how much the Fed is prepared to do, then you might have a similar response from U.S. shares. Because after all, if everything is going right, why aren't they going faster? Ostensibly, the only fly in this ointment is higher interest rates. And this is where the CPI data is critical. The expectation is that we are going to come down to 2.3% on the headline, but much of that is probably, again, coming from energy, as it did in August. Now, that, of course, is helpful to consumers that energy prices are lower, so it's nothing to sneeze at. But from the Federal Reserve's perspective, this is cold comfort because this isn't where they can really hope to have much agency. They can't, of course, mandate what's going on with global energy or food costs. Uh, so they're focused on what's going on here, core services, where most inflation lives at, at this point. And in that sense, it's this core number at 3.2% that we're, we're expected there that excludes energy, excludes food and where core mainly lives. As we look at this, if we get a number in line with expectations, that would be the third consecutive month at 3.2, which is to say core disinflation has stalled. We saw already at the beginning of this year, the Fed's reaction function when that happens, they become circumspect, they start to cut rate cuts from the forecast. Between March and June, they cut the forecast from three cuts to one, and of course, then in September, they went to four because the data had changed. But their response to slowing disinflation or stalling disinflation has been unmistakable. So if we get something in line with expectations, then perhaps the markets grow suspect of just how much easing there is on the menu for next year. We might also get an upside surprise, which could make things worse. After all, we are watching U.S. economic data tending to beat expectations now, and there is some indication that, in fact, cost pressures are rising. We saw from that very same service sector report last week that 
there has been the highest pace of price growth here since going back to April in the service sector. And of course, the service sector is the overwhelming uh, majority of the economy. It's uh, close to 80% of employment and something like 70% of overall GDP. So this is clearly where things live. And of course, as we just saw, it's the service sector inflation component that the Fed cares about and where there's still a big issue. Energy is a negative contribution to uh, inflation. So are goods at the core. Uh, and food is basically a rounding error at this point. So this is the game right here. And the ISM numbers suggest it's going the wrong way. Moreover, we just saw U U.S. jobs data that showed us that unexpectedly wages jumped to 4%. So well in excess of inflation, however you look at it, uh, good news perhaps for affordability and for the cost of living concerns that uh, remain after the pandemic's inflationary rise, but maybe also diluting of Fed rate cut expectations and indicative of a CPI number that could surprise higher. If that occurs, could we be here in the same boat, certainly not to the same magnitude, I think expecting a 20% decline from U.S. stocks in a week is uh, a bit crazy. But if stimulus expectations get undercut here and confidence starts to falter, as it has in China, well, then you could see this sluggishness and this unwillingness to make good on good news become an outright sell-off. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street uh, close and where it might take us there from. Uh, I'm on with Victor Jones for the price of truth on Wednesdays. That's coming up just 30 minutes after we wrap up here. So definitely check that out. Uh, I am back with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and commenting on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilya Spivak. If you're watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe. And Macro Money will be back tomorrow. Happy trading.